This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Mercier's. And I'm Nate Blyton. And this week, we are joined by our old friend Drew McManus from blustery <laughs> Chicago, Illinois. Drew is... That's what it sounds like out there. Uh, Drew is, of course, the publisher of Adaptistration.com, orchestra business consultant, um, and in charge of the Inside the Arts media empire. Uh, and is is uh, in, in, in some ways, I like to think of Drew as the Sound Notion senior orchestra business correspondent, <laughs> much like a much like a, a Daily Show correspondent, mm-hmm. except he knows what he's talking about. So, Drew, thank you for thank you for being with us this morning. Always a pleasure. Thank you. So you've you've got uh, this. There's a number of, of interesting things that we could talk about, and we'll we'll hopefully get to all of them this morning, but. You've got right now a really interesting project going on on Kickstarter, and I think we've mentioned it before on the show, um, and it has this name that I, like even the name, I have to think about what exactly it means. So, what is an Orchestra 990, and what does it have to do with your Kickstarter project? Yeah. Well, starting from base one, the 990s are the tax returns that nonprofits file with the Internal Revenue Service. These documents, in turn, need to be made public since nonprofits are open to that sort of level of transparency. Now, the trick with all of this is the organization will send the 990 to the IRS. The IRS makes it available in an image-based PDF file. And anyone who's taken an image-based PDF file knows that you can't do something like a keyword search, like if you're in a Word document or a Word searchable PDF file. So now what we want to do is to create a database of the last decade's worth of 990 returns from professional orchestras, but make them keyword searchable. So that's the project part. The second step of that is once everything has been converted, then putting it into an online database that will be completely free access to anybody who wants to use it to be able to do keyword searches, pull up the returns, and then be able to download those respective documents. So this is a, a move toward transparency and, and well, I let me... I'm not sure how to put this because there is that level of transparency already. Like you said, these are public documents, but they're not searchable and they're not sortable and they're all in different places. So you are taking this data that already exists and making it useful. Is that that's the plan, right? That's a good way to put it. Yes, it's it's probably the largest jump forward in in usable transparency since the 990s were actually made available to begin with. Because you're right, yes, they are available. Every nonprofit organization even has to provide it for anybody who calls, writes, or walks in their door and asks for it. But the usefulness of it, especially in today's culture, is just not very high. And if it's not usable, no one's going to take advantage of it. So you have to make it usable and easy for people. Well, so so you say usable, and that to me implies that there is a specific use case that you have in mind. What are some things that you think that people are going to do with this database, this all this information that they can actually use now? I was hoping you were going to ask that. That's probably the most common question that comes in so far is, who's supposed to use this? Why is it useful? And what I want to avoid with this, let me give you a little bit of backstory to how this business works with something like a searchable database record, is the idea is not something new in and of itself so much as current efforts are usually geared toward very specific subsets of people inside the business, such as grant researchers, are the the most common targets for people who use this information. But I'm looking at this like program notes Mm -hmm. to a concert. Program notes to me tend to be more specific than they should in trying to put an image into the listener's head of what it is they're going to experience. That's not the point. Everybody should experience the concert and the music in whatever way they want to. 
like, think of it like a kid. You know, why do you want to spoil a kid's imagination by saying this is what the music is supposed to be? The 990 database project is the same way. I'm not going to say it's for this stakeholder. It's for these people. It's for anybody who wants to be able to use the data. So you're going to have a degree of self-selection in this process. For example, musicians can use it to research information for their negotiation process. Executives can use it if they're getting a new job to be able to compare what compensation is for other executives in that same on ensemble or peer organizations. Board members can use it for the same purpose. Grant researchers can use it for what grant researchers have always used it for. But most importantly, individual stakeholder patron groups, which is a, a, a burgeoning movement inside this country, can use it to learn more about what the organizations do with the money that they give them. I think that's an, ac that's an excellent uh, use case that I didn't think of reading through here is, is the, the patron groups that we've seen uh, in these last couple of major labor disputes, there we, we saw, I, I was the first one, the first big one that I remember was the Detroit Symphony yeah. uh, with the Save Our Symphony group. And then there was there were similar groups in, in Minnesota this last round. And it, it seems like when I read the things that those people write, there's a lot of misunderstanding because they, you know, buy their tickets or they subscribe and they go to the concerts and they don't really think about what happens before and after those things. Um, and, and so I really like the idea of this as an educational tool for them, but, and then also the, the business tool I think is, is a little bit more obvious. The, the, the things, you know, how it would benefit uh, musicians and board members and, and, and other executives to, to, to see what's going on in other organizations. <clears throat> Um, but I also really like the idea of it as an educational thing for patrons. That's something that, that I, I didn't consider. Have you talked to anybody about this? How is it, how is it being, um, I guess, received by, uh, by, by people that, that you've talked to in, in the business and, and outside it? Well, by and large, it's received very positively. Uh, like all new things, there's going to be a transitional process where people kind of wrap their head around it because it's not something that exists. There isn't a comparable version of this some, somewhere else. The closest unreasonable comparison, let's say, is going to be something like GuideStar, which is a database that you can search organizations to download copies of the traditional image-based PDFs, but you only get a couple of years and then you've got to subscribe and it's expensive to get information past that. And there isn't any support content. That's the other element of the project is the website itself is going to help explain what the 990s are, what this means, what where this information is, how you can search, what you can find. And if you have questions, you'll be able to send it into a support board where we'll get back to answers as quickly as we can to help people better understand the information that's being supplied and why it's supplied the way it is. Yeah, we actually had a question uh, come in about this when we, when we told people that you were going to be on, and, and you as well asked people to send in some questions. We got a question from Doug French asking what kind of the key differences were between the 990 Project and GuideStar. So, I mean, GuideStar is, is, is first of all, not, not free, right? Um, well, it's free. You can set up a free account and then search through the first, I think, two or three years from the most recent available to two or three years prior to that. Uh, but that's as far as you can go. But more importantly, you can't search the 990s themselves. Right. And so we're getting this is getting more specific uh, than than GuideStar, right? This is something that is going to give us more information specifically about orchestras and we'll be able to to use that in a in a more powerful way because there are stronger connections between the data points well think of it this way you know let's say you're starving you need food somebody gives you a big sack of flour now i don't know about most people but if you're me i don't know what the hell to do with a large sack of flour to be able to eat that's what the 990s are right now it's a giant unprocessed bag of flour Go make yourself some food, dude. Okay. <laughs> How am I going to do this? 
the 990 database project is now going to give you something that's going to process that information so it's actually usable in a meaningful, let's say, nutritious way. <laughs> I, I like that. I like that yeah. analogy. Um, nutritious orchestra information. Right. Nutritious orchestra. That's what it, it, should, you should, it should be formatted on the page, like the nutrition facts. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. It's there it is. Thirty percent daily value here. Um, to me, the the most uh, the thing I'm looking forward to most. Um, I'm assuming this project will be a, will will get funded because it would be a travesty if it didn't. Um, is that it just changes the uh, access from a very small pool of people to a very large pool of people. And it actually, people who were inside the business in a very close way, it makes me think that they will enjoy this too because data that they might have an interest in is now right there at their fingertips, whereas they might have had, you know, air quotes, access to it before, but they had to go through the same rigmarole of digging it up and figuring it out and interpreting it. Um, but I'm also curious to see if people who, that you would have never imagined taking an interest in this kind of thing, um, you know, is there going to be like a Pelican brief thing that happens where somebody finds some kind of money embezzling thing that has gone down and we're going to catch somebody in criminal activity or something? <laughs> well, there's always the potential for that. There was the guy in uh, California that just got busted for embezzlement, uh, the executive director. Uh, but Let's take, for example, that situation in Minnesota that recently happened, where that patron organization group was one of the really first groups to challenge the information that was being provided in the labor dispute. And they did their own analysis of it. In order to be able to start to get all that information, you have to go through this laborious process of getting the image-based 990s and the rest of it. And everything you just mentioned, Sam, of making that easier for people to become really involved beyond just consumers is what this is. It is truly an open data source project. Yeah. So it's gonna I, be I'm, I'm, that's okay. something actually that, that, that interests me is I'm, I'm wondering if there's anybody that's not happy about the prospect of all of this yeah. stuff being so easily found. <laughs> Is there are, are there people that would prefer that this information stay in its current open but obscured state? I'm sure there are. Uh, you know, for years, I've been doing the compensation reports at Adaptistration, and you have to use the 990s to be able to get that information. And it's never as straightforward as this is what somebody's paid. You have to pull different parts of information together to get a clear picture. And no, no one really enjoys giving that information out. And I've encountered a wide variety of uh, response, let's say, from people who are very transparent and open when I ask questions and those who are deliberately hostile. And I think information by its nature promotes that variety of responses. So this, this I think, will definitely increase that, that exposure and, and anxiety among some individuals. But in the end, it's only going to do an organization good because when you're well-managed and you're well-funded and you're doing a good job at what you're doing, this only reinforces and quantifies that. Well, that's, that, I mean, this is how it sounds really great on the surface. Um, how's the how's the Kickstarter going? It's moving along. We've had a couple of good weeks where we're starting to really pick up some motion with the amount of social sharing that's going on. Um, we still haven't really punched through the point where the dams burst open and we're getting a huge flood of contributions. But uh, we've still got a couple of weeks to go. There are 19 days left. We still need to raise oh, about $36,000, a little less than that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we can do it, but it's going to take a very large effort among everybody to start to encourage their friends that this is something they need to take part in. Well, you're about to get the SN bump, you know. Right. <laughs> um, and I... I have a secret uh, desire. Well, not secret. I have a desire that it yeah, gets. You're going to tell us about it, right? <laughs> yes, that it gets overfunded. Because What's that? 
the most intriguing thing on the Kickstarter page for this is the stuff that says, basically says, given the chance, i.e., if you guys go crazy and we get more money than we are asking for, we might consider doing these things. Yes. Expand the number of orchestras is an obvious one. Include the, you know, how far you're going to go back is another obvious one. Include operas, which to me sounds like a lot of people, because there's a lot of the, the people who are really into opera seem to be very invested stakeholders in in the form, you know. Fair. Um, um, ballet. Oh, here it is. Downloadable comparison charts for targeted filter metrics. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. So it'll be it'll have a built-in way to start analyzing the data and comparing this data set and that data set and that kind of thing. Is this, this correct, Drew? Precisely. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly one of the things that's nice about the 990s is at least every organization is required to report the information the same way. Right. Now, you can have a healthy debate about how the numbers get into those categories to begin with, but that's a good debate to have. Right. And if you don't have the numbers, you can't have it. In this case, think of it like if you've ever used Google Analytics and that nice metrics dashboard they've come up. My crack team of programming hamsters that we've got working on this <laughs> have got everything figured out to where we're going to put everything into a hooked database, which if you're a WordPress geek, you know what I'm talking about. So each one of these little bits of data that can be searchable in a 990 form, since it all has a part and a number assigned to it in the form, we can take that information out. So you can say, give me A, B, C, and D from organizations X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And it will throw all that information out into a very nice Google Analytics looking style chart that you can still play with in real time and then download in whatever form that you actually want to take home with you. Right. And that's just, to me, it's another access thing, because, like, if the numbers are there, I'm, fit, I'm free to write them all down and stick them in Excel or whatever and crunch them in any way that I want. But somebody taking an interest in ha taking action based on what they find is far more likely when it's that easy to do, when you don't have to leave Chrome to make it happen. Right. Can't someone else do it for me? And we, yes. we want to try to do that as much as we possibly can. Step Absolutely. one, get the information in the system. Step two, with the second round of funding, or if we overfund it now, is to put that into place. But we're thinking ahead to that so that once we get to it, it'll be as quick and easy as possible to put it, to put it together. Yeah. Yes. That's great. Well, so well, you, go ahead, Sam. No, I'm just saying I really, really want this project to get funded. So... <laughs> If you want to help Sam and make his day wonderful when the project gets funded, you should go check it out on Kickstarter. Now, so one thing that I think is weird, Drew, uh, and, and we actually talked about this before this uh, launched and you blogged about the difficulty of doing this, you're making a platform that is going to be free. And yes. Kickstarter is a rewards-based platform that right. requires you to give certain amounts of money to get things. So how do you balance this Kickstarter project? I'm very interested in, in this project, not just as its goal, but as its process, because I'm very interested in Kickstarter and crowdfunding and, and, and uh, you know, people that are interested in big data and people that are interested in collaboration on the web. Like it, this really hits a lot of, uh, a lot of my, my special uh, interests. So uh, tell, tell us a little bit about how that, that, came to pass and, and what people were going to get from their their pledges that was that was an ongoing process that we had a number of discussions with kickstarter about because by its nature everything that you described is accurate they don't usually allow projects that's going to be a free giveaway which is ostensibly what this is we're not charging anyone to use the database there aren't restricted levels that you can do this but not that if you don't pay for it everything is open and everything is free it also is web oriented and they have a prohibition against building websites. So that's why we focus on the database aspect of it. It is the actual conversion process and then entering the information into the database. The final result and point of contact is just the website component. Uh, but then the actual benefits, what do you give people? Uh, and we got a number of great, uh, uh, suggestions and feedback from readers at Adaptistration, and you guys were fabulous with that as well. 
of what can you give people? And we expanded our scope to include some real basic things, which the most popular ones were your guys' suggestion, which is the Twitter shout out and the Facebook shout outs. Uh, you know, I've got over 3,000 Twitter followers, so that's not an unsubstantial reward, at least. If you want to promote something or promote yourself, you give five bucks and you're going to get that 3,000 Twitter follower exposure of hardcore followers in this business. Yeah, that's, that's the key is targeted mm -hmm. followers. Yeah. And then building on top of that are some of the more obvious ones, such as recognition at the website, the list of donors. Uh, we have an elevated profile recognition that for $150 or more, you can actually get a profile of yourself with your photo, a description, a bio that's connected as someone who is a primary giver. Uh, we've got a couple of fun ones as well, too. For $250, you get everything before that, but uh, we'll also set it up so that if you particularly like the way I sound and the way I pronounce things, I'll leave a voice reading for you on your voicemail. Like Carl Castle. That's who, yes. is, who is retiring, by exactly. the way? Yeah, I know, and I've got to get down to a show now that I live downtown before they... They finally say goodbye. But that's, yeah. that's exactly where we got that from. That's a great I like idea. It. Now, here's the thing. And Dave, Nate, you can see if you can help me with this. I, if I needed to scratch together $500 right now, I could. So the question is, at the pledge of $500 or more, you get 30 minutes of phone consultation. Is it pot with Drew McManus himself? Can I leverage 30 minutes on the phone with Drew into more than $500 in profit? Well, actually, you'll get an hour's worth of consulting time, not just 30 minutes. Oh, okay. There we go. Well, so so the answer is obviously yes. This. Obviously, I can, I can make $500 with an hour of Drew, you 30 know? 30 minutes could go either way, but an hour, yeah. no yeah. problem. Yeah. I just love that one. I love that one. Um, well, for a lot of people, especially, well, let's, let's take it for your guys' situation, which is composers. And composers mm -hmm. are going to be in an area that you're usually self-produced. How do you get up and running? How do you make your music available? How do you distribute it? Do you have questions about recording? I've worked on a number of recording projects to get physical CDs out. If you're doing benefit albums, there's all sorts of rules and regulations that go along with that. How do you deal with union contracts if you're using union musicians to record on your album? How do you put all this stuff together? I'm the person who can provide all of those answers to you. So if you don't want to go right. out and make the mistakes and pay the penalties, which you'll pay if you do it wrong, right? Yeah. you're going to just save more than $500 in penalties alone. There you Not go. Not the profit. Yeah. No, for sure. <laughs> we should totally do that. With Sound Notion, we should, we should, we should pull together $500 because we need some help, Drew. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... I don't know. Do we do we have anything else? Do you guys have anything else on this on this uh, 990 thing? Because I'm I'm curious about some orchestra business things as well. Yeah, let's move on. Uh, we haven't talked to you, Drew, since the Minnesota Orchestra came back and started, you know, playing music again for the first time in almost what is almost two years, right? right. Um, and uh, they they've missed a lot of really great opportunities since they've been gone. They since they stopped playing, were nominated for two Grammy Awards, won one Grammy Award, uh, lost the music director that led them to those Grammy Awards, and are now in a situation where, and we've talked, I've mentioned this before, that it's especially almost these great comic book names of the Michael Henson and Osmo Vanska are, are, could easily be comic book arch rivals. Yeah. Um, and there's this showdown, right? between the the Minnesota Orchestra Association and, and Michael Henson keeping his job as the president and CEO and Osmo Vanska, the former music director, willing to come back but not with Henson in charge. So what is what is the what is the story there? Is this is this something that's gonna um actually come to a head at some point? Something will have to happen. I mean, there's no doubt about that. But you hit the nail on the head, which the crucial element right now is focused around whether or not the CEO is going to remain with the organization. And this is interesting from a historical standpoint. And I think it deserves a little bit of attention from the perspective that in a traditional orchestra labor dispute, especially something that reaches this level of animosity, 
before the economic downturn, it was common that you just assume the CEO is going to be replaced. If nothing else, that's one thing the musicians would ask for behind the scenes saying, okay, we'll agree to the concessions, but you have to have a handshake deal on this person's going to go away. And that was quite common. But since the economic downturn, that's far less common. In fact, I think I published something about that a while ago with some actual stats where about three quarters or maybe two thirds of the orchestra executives uh, in labor disputes have remained firmly in place after the uh, concessions were finally achieved. So the situation of Henson is fascinating because you add this additional layer of pressure with the music director, someone who brought the organization to a new level of artistic accomplishment and recognition. And this person says, I'm not going to come back unless you replace this guy. So we've gone from the smoke-filled back room to the very public, transparent forum of a board having to make these decisions. And it falls into a degree of now personal exposure and risk for board members, which most nonprofit board members are not comfortable with. They're not prepared for it when they take a role of being a nonprofit board member. And they'll try to avoid that level of exposure and risk at all costs. And I think that's what's going on now in Minnesota is there's trying to be some sort of compromise worked out. But this is a situation where it's really a catch-22. They don't get that comfort of a compromise. They're going to have to make a decision and one way or another, there are going to be people who aren't pleased about it, but they have to remove themselves from the equation and really ask what's going to be best in the long run for the organization. I, I think it does seem unusual to me, like you said, that, that Henson has, has remained on after being one of the main causes of an orchestra losing as much as the Minnesota Orchestra has lost. <clears throat> um, and, and, you know, you think about the people that that lose their jobs for much less serious but equally public failures in in other orchestras and other nonprofits and even other you know businesses and and government organizations right how many people lost their jobs over something about the healthcare.gov site failing in in for nothing that they did wrong but because government IT procurement is is terrible Right. There's nothing they could have done that would have made the way that the government hires web developers better. But they lost their jobs because there was this huge public failure. This is a public failure on a much smaller and more local scale, but as as extreme a failure, it, it, perhaps even more extreme a failure uh, with with the Minnesota Orchestra lockout for a year and a half. And and Henson staying there is I think really surprising. But like you said, is, is Ann Parsons still at Detroit? Oh, yeah. So, uh, Ann Parsons is in Detroit. Uh, Allison Volgamore is in Philadelphia. Right. Uh, Rommelstein's in Atlanta. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the situation, I think, with, with Minnesota is, is interesting because it also defines the, the environment that we live in now, which really is the age of the executive. Um, mm-hmm. Just look at the Wall Street situation where there are plenty of executives who really didn't take any responsibility or have any kind of accountability for a lot of the problems that were caused. That culture has bled down into all aspects of society and the orchestra field isn't immune from that, unfortunately. So there's a degree, I think, inside the the Minnesota Orchestra Board that doesn't even see their actions or the leadership on the executive level as a failure. That's surprising to me. I, I can't see how anybody could look at the situation and not call it a, a pretty major failure. But I mean, yeah. I guess if, if it, if they really do think that he was, you know, fighting on the side of the angels, then I, I can see that he would just be like a crusader in that. But that's way too many religious metaphors to put together. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> The, I, I guess I can understand that, but it seems like, is this not something that, that 
patrons care about or or anybody that's donors are are caring about in any way well, i think patrons there certainly are i guess i guess the patrons would be on the side of of uh of uh vanska right they have been so far they've been calling for vanska's return and for the board to remove henson uh yesterday uh, it, just as soon as absolutely possible um that's been part of what we talked about before with the amount of uh, that that increased patron stakeholdership in the field that is doing a lot of good things. But it'll be interesting to see whether it's able to crack this very old, very hard nut inside the business of boards not wanting other people to tell them what to do. Yeah, that that's uh, hmm. well. You know, we the think... golden rule in the very old sense of I've got the gold, I make the rules, I don't <laughs> care what you think. Yes, I'm a I'm a steward of your trust, but it's my judgment. Thank you very much. Right. Well, that will be interesting. And, and you know, you th- we think that things like that are winding down, but they never completely <clears throat> go away. And as the process continues to lengthen and people get started before and the the effects continue afterward, it's almost it's it's like elections in in the United States, how the the campaign for the next election starts the day after the polls close on, you know, the, the year before. So it feels like this is continuing to expand the cycle of the 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 labor disagreement or the the, the labor negotiation, I should say, because it's not always you know, acrimonious. Well, the labor relations, right. which impact that negotiation cycle, because I don't think I don't think there's a secession of any hostility here right now. The musicians are still actively calling for Henson's removal. And if you don't, then that puts them in a very difficult position because now they're not going to be locked out. So what are they going to do? Play badly? Are they going to go on strike? Right. Well, and, and, and how long does this continue until it becomes a part of the next negotiation? Or worse, until it becomes a part of the internal culture of the organization. Well, I think we've burned that bridge already, right? Or well, maybe it, it seems I that way not. to me when I read about it. Like, I don't know if there is a bridge left to burn between the Minnesota Orchestra and the <laughs> MOA. They're spreading an oil slick on the river and setting that on fire now. Right. No <laughs> kidding. So, it's I think of- go into the Mississippi and just take everyone out along the way. Yeah. 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 Speaking of these expanding negotiation cycles, there are some a couple of new ones that have, have, have come to our attention in the last couple of months that are beginning to appear on the horizon of of the orchestra business landscape. One, the, these like really strange nebulous statements from Memphis that are like we're winding down, whatever that means, and things aren't great. And we'll tell you more later. What is what's going on in Memphis, Drew? That's an excellent question. Uh, Does anybody know? I think it's clear that they've made their financial position uh, very transparent. They've burned through all of their endowment. They have no cash reserve. If they have any line of credit, I don't know about that, it may be maxed out, or if they do, it's probably not very large. But they've made it clear that the spending levels where they're at now are not going to be something that's going to carry over into next year. And what do you do with that? How does it impact the organization? Everything now points to the fact that they're, quote, retooling themselves. So this winding down statement is really just soft language of, well, we're going to spend a lot less money than we were doing before, so we're going to do less, but we don't want to phrase that as a negative thing. We want to try to maybe make it look like a positive. Well, you can try to do that, but in the end, no matter how how pretty of a picture you can paint of this, people feel those differences. And whether or not it's going to be something people embrace after the fact, once they announce what these changes are, time will tell. Yeah. Well, and and we like like I said, there aren't a lot of details to share about that particular situation. And we'll just have to, you know, keep keep reading the the local papers there and see what happens. But um, that's that's something that's going to be something that will follow 
over the next few months. And another thing uh, that we'll be following over the next year or so is whatever happens with the Metropolitan Opera. It seems like the sides, uh, the, 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 the Metropolitan Opera management and Peter Gelb are starting to prepare themselves for some pr- something pretty serious. And uh, the, the unions have told their members to get ready to not get your regular paycheck for a little while. Expect, expect an absence of met income. Right. That, that's the line. And this is, and the, the opera is, is I think a much crazier situation than an orchestra, just because there are more stakeholders and more unions. Um, you know, we have not just the AFM, but there's probably also some is, I assume after is involved, right? When we're talking oh, yeah. about you... an opera, and then of course the 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 stagehands, uh, Ayatsi. A lot is, is more involved. stage people for an opera. Yeah. Mm. So right, are, are... you've got three major unions involved, and in opera that's been interesting because sometimes the unions don't necessarily work together. You'll have multiple negotiations happening simultaneously, and one group will agree to some concessions that another union was pushing back against and if that other union agrees to them you look like a great big giant ass in the public if you don't agree to the concessions as well yeah Mm. so they've got to stay together well and we saw a situation with the 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 stagehands at carnegie hall just Mm -hmm. just uh earlier this season uh that really messed up some 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 of carnegie hall's plans and that's since been resolved, but it's it gets really complicated when you've got these kind of multilateral agreements that involve so many unions. Well, and there's also a very different environment for the actual bargaining. The, the Met's been fascinating from the standpoint that the previous general director, Bobe, was actually doing the negotiations after Gelb arrived. Hmm. And that's highly unusual for an executive to want the previous executive to come in and conduct those relationships. This was Mm -hmm. an unusual scenario because Volpe actually came out of the union ranks. So he had a decent relationship with them to begin with, even though he was a very hard bargainer and he was a very rough edged kind of guy, still is, uh, but he's just not doing the negotiations there. So now you've got Gelb, who's a very different personality in all of this, who's got whatever financial pressures he's feeling. And that process of the negotiation with such established people, which New York is going to be some of the oldest, well-established, largest union bureaucracies on a local level in the entire country, how that's going to impact the the actual outcome really can't be underscored in this situation. That's and, and and again, this is one that's not not much has happened yet, but it sure seems like everybody is gearing up for something big. So we'll we'll have to. It's it's a it's another wait and see kind of thing. Um, do you, is there anything else going on in the, in the orchestra business that we should know about that we've missed, Drew? You're 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 our, our eyes and ears. Well, there's one more thing about the the Met situation I think is worth <clears throat> pointing out and noticing is in the post economic downturn environment, you see two types of scenarios that exist inside these highly calamitous negotiations which is we are completely out of money and screwed, so we've got to do something. Maybe let's call it Memphis at this point. And you have a situation like Philadelphia, where they were wanting to claim bankruptcy, but they weren't cash poor. They had a lot of money on hand. Minnesota had a lot of money on hand. The Met has a lot of money on hand. And from a negotiating standpoint, if you look at the situations in the country, that the employer has been able to leverage the strongest amount of concessions. It's been in the scenarios where the employer is cash flush. They can afford to spend the money on whatever negative negotiation cycle is going to happen. They can, they can take the cash hit for whatever money they're going to lose from 
uh, uh, an actual work stoppage, whether it's a strike or a lockout. And they're going to be in a stronger position to exert whatever influence they want, as opposed to being in a position where a board has the pressures of having no money. And so all of a sudden you have liability issues that come in. It's harder to keep the board together and focused. And I think that aspect is interesting here and now because it's clear that the Met is not out of money, not by a long shot, not like City Opera was. So that is something people really shouldn't underestimate and underscore in how this is going to potentially turn out. Well, and I think that also has a lot to do with the way it's perceived in, in, the, in the public, right? Is, 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 oh, yeah. Uh, not is everyone's understanding of the the financial situation of the institution and the economic environment that it exists in i think uh, has has a pretty profound impact on on the way people talk about it outside uh out, outside the the discussions and the negotiations themselves um so anyway that's it was very interesting to, to talk about this thing thank you for adding that to the conversation because uh, I think that's a really important thing to remember and certainly something I would not have thought of. Um, do we One have, more we, geeky piece of news just under the wire. What's that? Um, well, we were having the discussion whether oh, we the, wanted uh, to address the, it. The but Spotify thing. Should. Yeah. Um, so if you're, if you're a fan of streaming music, you probably have used and not known that you have been using uh, the services of a company called Echo Nest. Echo Nest is a spinoff of a really interesting project from the MIT Media Lab, um, and it, one of our big, big, you know, favorite groups of people in the world are the MIT Media Lab. They have done all kinds of wonderful things. They uh, are are the source of things, everything from Guitar Hero as as an idea to um, the, the, the robot operas of um, Space and on the Name. Uh, help me out, guys. Todd Mockover. Todd Mockover, thank you. Yeah. Um, and uh, everything in between. They put together, one, one of their projects was this kind of music intelligence engine algorithm where it could describe music in a computer understandable way to generate recommendations and in, in all kinds of business intelligence and musical intelligence and data intelligence and the sorts of things that Pandora was a pioneer in that required pe like actual people to listen to all of this music and describe it in all of these parameters. The Echo Nest is doing algorithmically and programmatically and figuring out how to recommend tracks and figuring out relationships between recordings that a, an individual person would have a very difficult time hearing or have a very difficult time putting together just because it's such a large data set. Um, and they have sold their products. It, it's, a, it's a little bit like selling data products of the sort that Nielsen has, uh, but they sell their data products to um, you know, RDO and Spotify and uh, Beats Music and, and all kinds of other companies that use music in their digital products, they were just purchased by Spotify. Uh, they say that they are going to continue their contracts with other companies that are not Spotify. Um, it will be very interesting to see how Spotify... I am hoping that they can improve the Spotify recommendations. <laughs> um, if if you want to see some interesting recommendations that uh, Spotify gives, you should find my Tumble log because I have a series there of Spotify being helpful and offering very strange recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, so the, Spotify, we've talked about this before, has a radio solution like Pandora where they you know try to build a, a kind of shuffle stream based on your interests or based on a, a song or an artist or whatever – and adapt it to what you like and don't like, it's not nearly as good as Pandora's. So hopefully they can fix that. And it's an interesting thing to, to follow. Do you guys have It's any... interesting to me that it's like, is, would, this be, would this ever fall under the parameters of like a trust-busting case? Like the tap of that kind of data, they now have control of it, and all the streaming services want it, Right. So it's like, you know, if you're manufacturing silver trinkets, you're buying the silver mine also that everybody else is using to build their silver trinkets, right? 
I don't think I don't. This isn't a commodity, though. Like other people could put together an algorithm. They're just not as smart as the dudes at MIT. Right, and that's what know, I'm and, saying. And well qualified ladies, I should add. <laughs> that's right. So, like, if and, you're mining for gold, you want the best, you know, uh, sifter you can buy. You don't want a crappy sifter that's not going to work as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. And that's your, but it, the the point is, it's your problem to figure out what's the good one and the bad one, and get the good one. Exactly. And or if in, you can't get the good one, make a better one. And mm. in the Spotify press release from a couple of days ago, they also make clear that the Echo Nest API will remain free and open, so that yeah. uh, so people can be able to continue developing their own apps, even if they aren't one of these uh, streaming giants. So. Yeah, small developers can use some some parts of the Echo Nest API for free, uh, which is awesome and very handy mm -hmm. uh, if you're a nerd, and because um, <laughs> I am, right? And uh, and they sell those 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 you know high value, uh, very you know powerful, fast, high bandwidth API connections to big companies like RDO. Mm -hmm. so, right. I think actually speaking of which, didn't RDO just make a new free tier that's like actually free again and i think maybe beats is, is considering doing the same because this is this is not sustainable i don't think with with paid only when you're competing with free as an yeah. option um just, anyway pretty much coinciding with spotify making mobile streaming free although you can't really pick an individual track you want to listen to for free right so, so they still have a way to <laughs> yeah <laughs> well you but know in those suggestions mike my thought with this wouldn't necessarily be the trust issue. It would actually go back to the old payola sure. laws mm -hmm. that went into play because the recommendations can all be based on this data. Let's say I'm someone who wants to try to promote my music. Let's say we'll put it back in the, the framework of, of what you guys do, which is composer. Let's say I want to actually go ahead and invest a little bit of money and pay these guys to help week and increase the likelihood of my music being recommended to somebody how does the consumer know where that line begins and ends hmm. that's really that's interesting and, and, and i think the that social media has been dealing with this same thing where you can get paid placement of of a tweet or a facebook message or something and it says sponsored near it mm -hmm. and that's and, and i feel like that's that's how Record labels have gotten around this forever is 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 just disclosing, right? When you watch an infomercial and it says the proceeding is a paid ad by blah 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 blah. Like that's oh, sure. because they have to. And if and if you knew and maybe this could be like a, a a value to the consumer, like you will get a better quality stream or um you know, this this version, this free version is not only ad supported, but also, you know, paid recommendation supported or something like that. Right. Um, and if it says this is a sponsored suggestion, I think that's not payola anymore, right? Because even a record label could pay to have a thing on the radio if they call it an ad. Sure. And that's a way that, that these groups get around this. But if you're looking at, at how things actually work as opposed to the way you see on the surface... If this is an algorithm and it's pulling out this information, that means you're going to have different bits of data that the system is assigned to look for within whatever piece of music that it's going to be searching. If you're a composer that wants to have that algorithm function with a greater degree of parameter scope, mm -hmm. that's not necessarily going to be paying them to recommend you but it will put you in a higher position to be recommended more often than so, someone else. That's interesting. So it's not just paying, you know, quid pro quo. You're just kind of weighting certain parts of the algorithm. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, you're talking about a level playing field and yeah. you know, even open access right now. And the, the problems that are going on there with the potential of your ISP being able to start to throttle speeds that you are going to be able to use to connect to individual websites. No longer does everybody have that level playing field that everyone has to offer and have the same level of access. That's what we're talking about here. And does this company as a commercial enterprise have to have any kind of self-regulation? And if they don't, does it even rise to the level of where 
regulating bodies and authorities are going to be able to assert those sorts of oversights and rules. Well, that's really interesting. I've been reading a number of stories recently that are talking about some business moves that Spotify has been making over the last month or two. And it, it seems to a lot of observers as though they are headed in the direction of an IPO. And if they are a public company, that might change some of the things that they have to disclose about these, these relationships as well. So potentially, but let's say you want to make some money now with composers. Then if, if I'm a guy, who that's wants a silly to to, idea, Drew. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, not if you're the guy who wants to take your money. <laughs> right. If I'm the guy who wants to play on a composer. So you want to, you want to make money from the composers. Right. That's, okay. that's the business stream and the questions that composers need to start to ask themselves. And you can even spin it around to turn it into a situation where you can create your own collectives, where if you're part of our organization, then let's say you're a service organization to represent composers, we pool our money to pay these organizations so that all of our members' recordings mm. can start to tweak those search results a bit. Like an independent radio promotion co-op. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, a lot of directions it can go, some of which are far more dubious than others. Well, I think <laughs> you know, independent radio promotion is already pretty dubious. So yeah. <laughs> there's a there's a there's a programmer at Spotify who's watching the show live stream and went is going, Oh yes. He never <laughs> occurred to him before. But we now. can exploit composers. I think we've talked to that person on the show before, actually. <laughs> so um, the the payola scandal uh, updated for modern times will be emailing money to your PayPal account and then him doing a little tweaking in the code. You no, know, it's got to be bitcoins. You got to yeah, have well, your, yeah, your brown yeah, envelope yeah, of bitcoins. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh gosh. <laughs> anyway, it's got. So, I think we just got a little too geeky. I'm gonna have to. Uh, watch up here <laughs> sam do you want to do you want to talk we, we've talked on this on the show a lot about how interesting the future of opera is and two of the people that are very closely involved in the the direction that opera is headed just passed away this week uh including one that uh i think sam is particularly uh attached to because of his interest in in media opera yeah uh, sam you want to take those Robert Ashley uh, died, I think it was the 3rd, March 3rd. Yeah, like um, Monday, I think. Yeah, um, at 83. Anyone who's not familiar with his his work, I mean, um, you know, opera can be pretty broadly defined. And if you get that picture in your mind and then go listen to some Robert Ashley work, you'll find that it's out at the edge of probably what you had in mind when, when you when you broadly defined opera in your mind. Um, it's interesting that um, he did his, you know, work in school and was working at what it wasn't at Ann Arbor. It was, uh, oh, hold on. He was working. I'm sorry? I'm playing a little bit of an opera. Oh, okay. A Robert yeah. Ashley opera. It's obvious. Right. So this is he did a lot of stuff for video. University of Michigan. He was in school working at the University of Michigan Speech Research Laboratory, laboratory, and was offered the chance to uh, work for a doctorate in that program, and then turned it down to pursue music. So that's a good uh, sort of frame to get an idea of the kinds of things he was interested in. Very much the rhythm and sort of natural quality of voice had a belief that um, you know if you speak. Even if the the phonemes is that the word I'm looking for yeah. of of what you're saying are uh, obscured and you can't tell what the literal meaning of what you're saying is, it still conveys emotion by all the other things present, um, which is not you know a, a groundbreaking idea or a new idea even, but he really took that relationship very far afield in his own work. Um, and never lost interest in, in the intricacies and nuances of basically how the human voice works. Well, and I think he did a lot to, to, to get people thinking about opera outside the context of an opera house. Um, right. And, and make it less fancy. Yeah. Uh, which I think is exciting to me. I hate talking about classical music like it's fancy. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's not fancy. It's yeah. It's just music. And yeah. Uh, he did a lot of work with television uh, yeah. as, 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 a, as a medium, which is like the, the least fancy thing I can think of. Um, I'm sure. 
I'm sure to the the chagrin of people who like to call themselves opera professionals at the time when he did this kind of thing too. Absolutely. Um, also, it's uh, the way to think about it is he took language and words and speech and broke it down and showed it back to you in a way that I would consider somewhat at least analogous to the way Merce Cunningham broke down dance and movement and then displayed it to you in a different way that you, you know, sort of recontextualizing what we think dance is. I think he did the same kind of thing with speech and communication. Right. Uh, and so I would encourage you to check out on YouTube some clips of his, his video operas because they're, they're really very interesting and you can find a lot of good stuff uh, from him on, on YouTube. Uh, we also uh, lost uh, Gerard Mortier this week, uh, who was a longtime music director at a number of different opera companies. He uh, seemed to have difficulties with some certain kinds of interpersonal relationships and was, was moving around a lot. Um, but he most recently is associated with the Teatro Real in Spain and uh, had been at the City Opera in New York, rest in peace City Opera, uh, and uh, he did a number of... Paris Opera, Salzburg Festival. All, all, like some of the biggest opera companies in, in the world and was involved in all kinds of things. I was just watching an interview with him um, a couple of weeks ago that was on YouTube about uh, the uh, the Brokeback Mountain opera that we've discussed. And he has just really interesting thoughts ab about the the kinds of topics that are appropriate for opera and he was did a lot of work in kind of modernizing the sorts of, of, of ideas that you could present in opera because they would relate to the audience differently and still lead to this same larger understanding by bringing in these more modern um, kind of direct connections to the audience but still have this operatic, this grandiose operatic um, kind of galactic meaning to 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 the the opera so he was a, a really really interesting guy he, he passed away this week of uh some kind of cancer pancreatic cancer maybe pancreatic cancer. um but it's sad to see both of these guys go and um but we will be seeing the impact that they had on opera both of them for for many many years yeah uh, it should be pointed out that uh robert ashley completed his latest opera crash just three months prior to passing away. And it's going to be a part of a, uh, a big show running April 10th through the 27th at the Whitney museum. Yeah. Um, and it's called 50 years, three operas spanning nearly 50 years. So I, I guess they threw this up there hastily. It doesn't cover what operas, but one of them is going to be the newest one that was just finished, Crash. So Crash and two other of his operas are going to be uh, staged. Yeah, both of these guys were working right up until the end. I mean, the, the interview yeah. I saw of, of Mortier discussing uh, uh, the uh, the Brokeback Mountain opera was just from the end of January. So, um, yeah, Dave, and I almost forgot. I, I, I bragged about this earlier, but I was actually a composer at a conference that Robert Ashley was also a composer. At. Well, so, you're clearly much more worthwhile human being than I am. Robert <laughs> Ashley and I were like right here. Here's Robert Ashley. Here's me. You know, yeah. uh, basically, basically contemporaries. Yeah. Well, I mean, sure, if you must. Yeah. <laughs> so I bet I could beat him at disc golf. Well, certainly now, but I bet then I could have. So, um, that okay, <laughs> that's, I'm glad we cleared that up. Uh, so I think that's going to do it for us this week, right? Is there anything else we're missing? Um, thank you so much for joining us live, those of you that joined us live. Uh, if you'd like to watch the show live, we do stream it at soundnotion.tv slash live, and uh, you can join us in chat there and, and ask any questions that you have of us there. Um, you can find the notes to this show, this episode. Sam puts together some really great show notes that I don't plug enough. They're they're very informative and entertaining to read, and you can read them at soundnotion.tv slash sn, which is our site. Um, and you can also find everything that you need to know about the the orchestra business and orchestra consulting at Drew's site, adaptstration.com, where you can also, uh, we'll link to, to Drew's Kickstarter on our site, and you can also find I'm sure many links to Drew's Kickstarter on his site. Drew, do you have any uh, uh, upcoming big projects besides the the Kickstarter that you want to plug? 
Uh, the Kickstarter is the big one right now. Beyond that, I've been focusing all of my energy on growing uh, venture, which I'm in the process of the unfun process of doing tax preparation right now. But looking back at 2013 and the growth of venture, we've grown 106 percent since the the previous year, and nice. it's only starting to speed up from there. So nice. that's been great. So if you need a web solution for your arts program, you should you should certainly check out Venture. The the as the... artists, that's the one big area of growth we've had this year. Oh yeah, we of course. To individual artists, in addition to the arts organization. And the stuff is absolutely gorgeous. If you haven't seen the, mm -hmm. the, the, the work, it's, it's beautiful. Um, so, so you definitely are going to want to check that out if you're looking for a, a, a website solution. Um, so check that out. Uh, that's, uh, where can people, that's VenturePlatform.com? Uh, VentureIndustriesOnline.com. Okay. We'll get that right in the show notes. Uh, <laughs> VentureIndustriesOnline.com. Um, you can also connect with all of us on the social media machines as a group as Sound Notion. We're at Sound Notion on Twitter. You can like us on Facebook and subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, if you have a suggestion for something that you'd like us to talk about on the show, you can tweet at us with hashtag SNWeekly, and we always check that as we're putting the show together. You can also find me on Twitter as Dave McDow. Nate is at Tree. Sam is at Housegoy. And Drew is at Adaptistration. Uh, so you should you should definitely follow all those folks on on Twitter and uh, learn all more than you could ever possibly want to know about the things that we are interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, you can subscribe to this show and all our shows at Sound Notion TV in the iTunes Store. So be sure to do that. You can check out this past episode of Streamers and Punches. Kevin and Bill break down their thoughts on uh, the the Oscar winning music uh, from from last Sunday night. Uh, very. Uh, well, they have some opinions. I'll leave it there. Um, that's, that's called a tease in the business. And uh, if you'd like to support us, tell your friends about how great our show is and how much they sub should subscribe to us because uh, having, having more listeners makes everything we do better and easier and more fun. So uh, tell your friends. Is, 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 is my call to action for the week. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lab. Thank you again so much for watching or listening, and we will see you back next week.